Dear participants, dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to the second meeting of the Leuven Seminar in Classical German Philosophy. Today, four distinguished scholars will discuss an important new contribution to Kant scholarship, a new book with the title Kant's Reform of Metaphysics, the Critique of Pure Reason Reconsidered. It has just been published by Cambridge University Press. The author of the book is Karin de Boer. She is professor of philosophy at the University of Leuven and also the author of, of two other monographs, Thinking in the Light of Time, Heidegger's Encounter with Hegel, published with the State University of New York Press in 2000, and On Hegel, the Sway of the Negative, published with Paul Grave Macmillan in 2010. She has written numerous articles on Kant, Hegel, and contemporary continental philosophy, and she co-edited a volume on conceptions of critique in modern and contemporary philosophy, which was published also with Paul Grave Macmillan in 2012. She's also um, co-editing a volume on the experiential turn in 18th century German philosophy, <coughs> And this is a volume uh, which is about to be published by Routledge. I am very happy that we succeeded in having Karin de Boer among us tonight. Good evening, Karin. <laughs> Good evening, honey. <laughs> the, the structure of our meeting tonight will be as follows. First, Karin will give a short presentation of her book, and then we will give the floor to our four um, speakers uh, who will give their comments and ask some questions about Karin's book. So the first speaker to, to whom we will give the floor is Stefanie Buchenau. Hello, Stefanie. Hello. Um, and after a speaker has given his or her comments, and has asked her or his questions, Karin will reply off the cuff to them. So following this model, we will hear comments first by Stefanie Buchenau, then by Brian Chance. Hi, Brian. Then by Paul Franks. Hello, Paul. And last but not least by Eric Watkins. Hello, Eric. So as I said, we start with a short overview by Karin herself. And so please, Karin, the floor is yours. Tell us what you have done in your new book. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Henny, and uh, also thanks for your kind introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Henny, Steve, and Pavel for setting up this uh, book launch. I'm very pleased uh, to see all of you. And before I start, I would also like to thank everyone, uh, students, uh, junior researchers, friends, and colleagues with whom I had very interesting and stimulating conversations on Kant's and uh, related subjects uh, in the past. So this book um, dates back to at least uh, 10 years. Uh, so over all these years, I have profited a lot uh, from these discussions. Okay, so let me try to explain very briefly what the book is about. Um, roughly speaking, it challenges a way of framing the critique of pure reason that I think uh, can be traced back to neo Kantianism. So according to this conventional way of framing the critique of pure reason, Kant is first and foremost trying to identify the conditions of possibility of experience. This approach ties Kant's project very closely to the natural sciences. And I, I think that this approach is still um, uh, pre prevailing today and also shares a lot of uh, common ground with um, Strawson's influential The Bounds of Reason, sorry, The Bounds of Sense. Uh, so in my book, I try to shift the focus from the problem of experience to the problem of metaphysics. More in particular, I take on to engage in the critique of your reason with the metaphysics represented by Leibniz, Wolf and, Wolf and their followers. And I in what follows, I'll try to specify the shift 
that I take the book to carry out by um, focusing on three aspects. The third aspect um, concerns the notion of the Copernican revolution. Yes, as we all know, Kant presents the critique of pure reason as some kind of revolution in the B preface, but it seems to me that this notion of a Copernican revolution is uh, misleading in the sense that it doesn't do justice to uh, other passages where Kant rather presents the critique of pure reason as carrying out a reform of metaphysics. Yes, as, a, as an effort to trans transform metaphysics into a science. So um, on my reading, it's really important to uh, look at the critique of pure reason as a reform. And this means that we also um, have to stress uh, very much Kant's specific notion of critique. So what I um, uh, propose is that Kant's notion of critique is not just a negative one, but has a negative and a positive element. Um, moreover, I take um, uh, Kant to carry out his critique by making a distinction between two aspects of metaphysics or two parts of metaphysics as they were uh, elaborated in the Wolfian tradition. Namely, on the one hand, general metaphysics, and on the other hand, special metaphysics. And I argue in the book that Kant carries out his critique with regard to both disciplines, yes, or both main parts of metaphysics. So I will very, very briefly explain how I take this to work out with regard to general metaphysics. Yeah? Now, I take it that Kant, in the critique of pure reason, um, or more specifically, in the Transcendental Analytic, tries to um, isolate or identify the positive core of former general metaphysics, namely by identifying the categories and the principles of the pure understanding. Yes, so these constitute, as it were, the, uh, uh, together the rational core of former general metaphysics in the sense that they represent the um, a priori elements that are presupposed in any cognition of objects. The critical strand of the transcendental analytic, by contrast, consists in demonstrating that these a priori concepts and principles can only be used with regards to possible objects of experience. And the argument in this regard is that these pure concepts or categories are in fact nothing but rules that tell the human mind how to unify a manifold of representations, yes, so as to produce objects. Uh, according to this um, uh, reading, the uh, uh, Kant already in the Transcendental Analytic demonstrates that theoretical knowledge of God, world and soul is impossible. Yeah, given, given this restriction uh, that he imposes on the limits within which a priori cognition of objects is possible. Uh, so um, uh, what I stress in this context is that uh, Kant salvages a number of pieces of a priori cognitions of objects or sy synthetic a priori cognitions, namely those pieces of cognition that have the structure of um, judgments and function as principles. Yes, so all events have, have a cause is a piece of synthetic a priori cognition that is valid according to Kant insofar as it articulates the rule or a rule to unify a number of uh, representations. Okay, I think that Kant with regard to special metaphysics proceeds in a similar manner, namely um, he identifies the pure elements of former special metaphysics, the ideas of reason, as well as the conceptual determinations that um, determine these ideas in an exhaustive manner. And as long as special metaphysics does not uh, uh, pretend that its determinate thoughts of these ideas amount to objects, there's nothing wrong with special metaphysics. Yes, it can be preserved. Okay, so uh, the second aspect uh, concerns 
his actual account of the conditions of possibility of experience, especially in the uh, transcendental deduction. Now, on my reading, Kant's um, analysis of these conditions of possibility of experience is not an end in itself, but functions as one particular stepping stone in, a, in an argument that is intended to um, um, uh, determine to what extent the human mind is capable of a priori cognitions of objects at all. Yes, and I will not uh, discuss the more technical details um, uh, of this uh, aspect of my uh, book. The final and third aspect that I would like to briefly uh, mention is the way I try to shift the focus from the critique as an end in itself to the system of pure reason that Kant uh, envisions, that he had in mind, that he announces, but that, that he never actually uh, published. And so it seems to me that we need to think of the critique as a propedeutic, uh, as Kant himself repeatedly stated. A propedeutic that is intended to determine um, how metaphysics can be elaborated uh, in a scientific manner. And I argue in the final chapter that uh, according to Kant, metaphysics can be elaborated in a scientific manner insofar as it limits itself to a systematic treatment of all uh, a priori elements of uh, our cognition of objects. And I try to substantiate this shift from the critique to the system of pure reason by offering a, a reconstruction of the system of pure reason uh, such as uh, Kant uh, envisioned it. Yes, and we can do so by looking at, uh, at his comments uh, on this uh, topic. In this regard, I argue that Kant would have proceeded by, in each case, asking which concepts a certain discipline must presuppose in order to determine its object or its subject matter in an exhaustive manner. And I secondly hold that Kant aimed to deduce each of these conceptual determinations by uh, drawing on the uh, table of categories. And I think that by looking at, uh, at Kant's intentions, rather than, than focusing only at what he actually achieved, it is possible to shed new light both on the critique of pure reason, but also to, um, uh, to see that there is maybe more continuity between Kant's uh, endeavor on the one hand and uh, German idealism uh, on the other hand. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. Um, now we will go to uh, Stephanie. Stephanie Buchenau is maître de conférence, habilité à diriger des recherches at the University of Paris 8, Paris 8. And among her publications, I uh, quote, um, the founding of aesthetics and the German Enlightenment, the art of invention and the invention of art, published by Cambridge University Press in 2013, and also in, published in 2014 with Classique Garnier Paris, Médecine et Philosophie de la Nature Humaine, de l'âge classique aux Lumières. That is a collection uh, edited, um, co-edited by Stephanie. So Stephanie, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, fun, the funny thing is I have been very enthusiastic about Karin's idea and project, even before reading the book in detail, from a mere glance at a summary on Academia Edu back this summer. I was quite immediately convinced by her idea and the main point, which is to read Kant's first critique, not as a demolition, but as a reform of Wolf's metaphysics. And this is why I'm happy to be part of this book launch today. Karin's book participates in a wider tendency of recent historiography to inquire into Kant's historical sources. Wolf and his disciples who have been suffering from 
such a bad philosophical reputation for centuries have finally begun to spark a wider interest in the last 20 years, beginning with the publication of Wolf's Gesammelte Werke by Jean Ecole uh, to the first International Wolf Congress in 2004, the Wolf Handbuch, um, various collective activities and groups in Leuven, uh, Paris, um, where we have been holding our group, group de recherche uh, sur les lumières allemandes uh, for about 15 or 20 years and have never been able to go beyond Wolf. Uh, in Halle, where there has been founded the Christian Wolf um, Gesellschaft in the States, in Canada, etc. And one may also mention many important individual translations, Baumgartens, um, collective volumes, editorial collections, uh, studies on Wolf and the Wolfians by Paola Rumore, Clemens Schweiger, Jean Paul Pacioni, Corey Dyke, and many others, of, um, many of whom are present today in this virtual space. So there have been forerunners, but Karen's merit, I think, is to ask a very direct question and formulate a very direct thesis, targeting the very core of Kantian philosophy, the first critique. Her idea is to read Kant's first critique as a reform or rebirth of uh, Wolf's metaphysics, as if Kant himself, at least to some extent, was still a Wolfian. And just propose some sort of detour, as Kant himself puts it in a letter to Kessner. This perspective is indeed new and productive because it um, challenges long tradition employing Wolf as a negative foil and describing him in negative terms as so, uh, this one-eyed pre-critical philosopher who tied up his, in, in his conceptual armor, remained entangled in difficulties impossible to resolve from his pre-critical viewpoint. I mean, that has been the standard view for so long. And um, Karin, and so she really overcomes this view and she tries to make something uh, different and to make better sense of both Wolf and Kant uh, by presenting Kant as continuing Wolf's older project, which from a pure, purely methodological viewpoint uh, already seems to me to be a far more promising strategy. I mean, just not evaluating thinkers, but just from a methodological viewpoint. Of course, this is a hypothesis, I mean hers, that needs to be spelled out in detail, which is a challenging task, because it requires such a thorough knowledge of Wolf, Kant, and the technical debates around the first critique. But Kant, uh, Karin has put some thought into this, and with great courage and intellectual property, she tackles these debates and the huge amount of secondary literature that comes with it. The result is a book, a real book, with a clear focus and a highly convincing main argument, which at the same time contains very side arguments, raises millions of questions and sets some sort of challenging research agenda, I think, for the years to come. As I said, I've been totally convinced by the main argument from the outset, and after reading the book, I've reached a better understanding of Kant, and I've learned a lot. But I do remain intrigued about some details and side arguments, and here, so here are four questions. Um, that uh, Karen's research has inspired me for difficult questions. And the first one is the longest. So first question. In the second preface of the Critique of Pure Reason, Kant adopts a both metaphysical and an epistemological outlook when mentioning the plan that the critique prescribes, that is the future system of metaphysics and its method, and Wolf's merit as the greatest among all dogmatic philosophers who, quote, would have been the most suited to bring metaphysics into the condition of a science, if only it had occurred to him to prepare the field for it by a critique of the organ, organ namely of pure reason itself. The famous quote. And Karin, as she just said, gives priority to the first, the metaphysical problem setting that she presents as an alternative reading to the epistemological one. She associates the former, as she just said, with certain metaphysical interpretations um, defended in the 1910s and 20s, Heidegger and so forth, and the latter of his neo-Kantian and analytical readings by Cohen, Strauss, and etc. And she says her interpretation is closer to the first metaphysical type. Um, but since she also explains that she wants to read Kant in view of the past, which she responded, one should perhaps not dissociate these two perspectives. I mean, that's what I would suggest. The question is, are the metaphysical and logical or epistemological problem setting intrinsically linked for Kant and Wolf? And uh, I would even say, isn't this transformation of metaphysics still part of a new epistemological program and debate on method characterizing the early modern age in the Wolfian school? So 
um, I, let me explain a little bit. Let us have a glance um, at one of here at one of Wolf's shorter essays, which Karen does not mention, despite her very careful reading of Wolf's German and Latin treatises. Um, so one of these shorter essays, which are among my favorite texts, where I think the short, I mean, I like the short essays because I think it may, sometimes it allows Wolf to to position himself more freely in, in philosophical debate. So there is this essay, um, which I strongly recommend uh, to all of you, um, the Kleinere Schrift, in the Kleinere Schriften, uh, volume 21-2, De Notionibus Directricibus et Genuin Usu Philosophiae Primae, of Directing Notion and the Genuine Use of the First Philosophy from 1729. Wolf here clearly announces his project, which is to transform what he calls the first philosophy or the fundamental discipline, that is ontology, into an architectonic um, science. And um, containing a set of directing, I mean, um, or guiding notions uh, according to a systematic or connected order, which in his view had been missing in the old Schulphilosophie philosophy or scholasticism. And Karen alludes to this on page 22. Wolf states that casts into such a systematic shape these directing notions claim themselves a methodical value and can serve as the first elements and rules of conduct for a general art of invention or method for the discovery of unknown truths. These directive notions from ontology, he asserts, I quote, resemble torches. They kindle a light and show the path that one needs to take in order not to lose oneself, paragraph three. Uh, according to a second small and equally fascinating essay, which has very recently been republished um, at, uh, at, at Minor um, on, on, on um, connect uh, the zusammenhangenden um, Verstand systematicity, the systematic intellect. And according to the second essay, systematizing basically means connecting. Uh, and the project of systematization of ontolo ontology that Wolf envisions sets out with common notions, which according to Wolf are notions that we all empirically know and share, whether or not we are mathe mathematicians, such as Euclid, whom he reads very attentively. This implies that Wolf himself performs a shift from mathematic and logic to metaphysics within this debate on method, while holding the two lines of thought together. And I think it would be worth the effort to inquire deeper into Wolf's particular notions of method, directive notions, architectonic and systematicity here uh, within this broader Cartesian, post-Cartesian debate um, uh, on, on method and Kant's depth to these, this project and notions. For doesn't Kant directly take up this project when establishing a metaphysic, taking the secure path of a science, as he puts it, when proposing a catalog or inventory of all pure concepts of reason and an outline or entwurf, and when calling his criticism as a propedeutics to such a metaphysics, a discipline as an argument. And notice that Wolf himself does not intend to offer more than an entwurf in a way, and a mental system being a project and an involve an exercise of self-thinking and reasoning or connecting the work in progress. I mean, it's open, it's an open notion of systematicity. And so that was a very long first question, which is on the relation between the metaphysical and the epistemological. Are they really disjunctive or are they related? And what light does such an, would such an epistemological or transformation of metaphysics shed on the very notion of metaphysics? Its definition scope higher aims, which, as Karin suggests to herself, may be moral and practical. So that was a long first question. The second question follows from the first one and concerns the narratives that Karin proposed in the first chapters. These chapters offer a highly instructive and careful reconstruction of Kant's reading of Wolf in the 1760s and 70s, many great quotes. Um, Karin mentions Kant's step to Wolf's gnosiological approach to ontology and his ambition to dispel scholastic obscurity and then tries to identify the different moments or layers of Kant's reflection and construction of a critical viewpoint via, one could say, a different mode of systematization of these ontological or directive notions, I would say. And uh, my perspective here may differ from Karin's. From my viewpoint, a first disagreement between Kant and Wolf seems to concern the choice of method, I mean, there are the, or the, the details. Um, uh, and here I think that Kant's Preisschrift, the 1764, 
for inquiry on the aims and method methodical tools of the mathematician and philosopher for attaining distinctness and certainty would deserve more attention, for Kant seems to clear up his wolfiness understandings, overcome mathematical habits and erroneous first notions, and denounce a new architectonic science, which is no longer simply an ontology. And um, notice that Kant never give, gives up the idea of a set of common, shared, empirical notions, so, um, sensible notions from which both the mathematician and the philosopher need to start, um, according to Wolf's own typology of cognitions, empirical, philosophical, mathematical. Um, so if Kant tries to find ground, ground as, as Kant says, this philosophical inquiry, I think, already concerns common empirical notions. And uh, these are not the result of philosophical inquiry into grounds, as Kant Karin states. So, um, so I think, so this, there would be this first moment, I mean, the first um, this disagreement concerning details of method, philosophical method, and then a second disagreement between Wolf and Kant concerning the distinction between empirical and intellectual notions absent from Wolf, and there Karen puts much emphasis on this, and it, this is very interesting, and she presents Kant's approach as a two-pronged critique of metaphysics, I quote, concerned with two complementary usages of intellectual concepts, either by relying on sensibility or, or by abstaining from the latter. She also claims a distinction between first order and second order in investigation concerning respectively the principles constitutive of any cognition of objects and the conditions of possibility of certain metaphysics. It's, it's very interesting. And that, that I would also see this uh, second disagreement between Wolf and Kant, but then I would also see a, a third disagreement, uh, perhaps, which um, Karin does not mention, and so I would like to have her, her viewpoint on this, um, on, the, on the necessity, I mean, on Kant's emphasis on the necessity to combine dogmatic and skeptical perspectives to better secure the foundings of such a metaphysical system, um, which seems to be very important for this um, variation of perspectives, and Kant seems precisely to allow Kant to, in a way, to, to, uh, um, to strip off the label of the Wolfian, overcome the partial views of the schools and establish a unique philosophy, which is not the Schul philosophy, instead of several systems and schools. So I would also see this. And then there is this false disagreement, I mean, between Kant and Wolf on the relation and hierarchy between the various disciplines and special metaphysics or metaphysica specialis, making up general metaphysics, ontology, psychology, cosmology and theology, and Kant still seems adapted to the systematization and hierarchy, um, and in particular perhaps to avoid an invention of cosmology, I mean that's perhaps also something that one uh, could dis discuss, and, and then at the same time there seems to be deep part, so what the, the, the question would be here, what, I mean, how do Karin see the different moments of this evolution, the important strands, and and disagreements between the two thinkers and the re refinement that Kant has progressively led to articulate. I mean, so that was the second question. And my third question, what about the Wolfians, Wolf pupils? Don't they deserve even greater attention in this narrative and attempt to ad identify moments and layers in Kant's progressive systematic ordering of notions? There is, of course, Baumgarten, whose metaphysics Karen does discuss, they may be Crucius, not sure how central he is, but there are certainly Mendelssohn. And uh, notice that Wolf himself speaks, um, um, I mean, Wolf himself, he speaks about directive notions. Um, he, he sets up his uh, perspectives on concepts, and syllogism, etc., in his logic, which will certainly influence Kant. But then, I mean, the, the terminology and the, 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 the epistemology and the doctrine of faculties is not the same in, in Wolf and in, in Kant. And I think that, um, um, there, I mean, what is at stake here is the very process of elaboration of this epistemology and psychology. And Wolf, I mean, um, he does not have the same vocabulary and he does not even draw a distinction between ideas and concepts. And I think, um, so from this viewpoint, it's perhaps difficult and perhaps unjust to object to Wolf to be one-sided uh, on this point, because I think that, I mean, Mendelssohn is really important for this, for this um, notion of idea, which is just missing in, in, in Wolf. And I think there is some sort of missing link here, which, which would just 
uh, allowed to really reconstruct the whole story and which is um, for which Mendelssohn is very important because Mendelssohn is really the one who brings this platonic perspectives in about, I mean, this idea of ideas, which is a platonic perspective perspective linked to his um, feed on in 60, 1766 or seven, I think, uh, which I, uh, Klaus Reich has already showed that, that Kant must have read. And this seems to me to be important to me. That's really something. And which is really, and then he's, I mean, Mendelssohn is so present in the first critique. So the question is, what do you make um, uh, of these students and um, how, how do, get, do they uh, be, how do they fit into this this narrative? And my fourth and last question, I mean, they, as you can um, as you can notice, it become more and more difficult. Uh, if Kant settles part of his dispute with Wolf in 1781 in the first critique, um, after already having spent much pre-critical effort to refuting Wolf, he's not yet finished in 81. He will continue to use Wolf in textbooks. He will come back to unresolved issues all the time. In the groundwork second critique. Um, which we will present as an improved Wolfian practical uh, universal philosophy in the third critique, where according to a famous letter to Weinhold, Kant comes back to teleology, which is one of, uh, of these other um, disciplines invented by Wolf. So, I mean, the question is, um, uh, so yeah, how, how, how does this continue? And I don't, I wouldn't uh, want to say that uh, you should have or could have treated all these questions in a single book. On the contrary, I think you, you, you made the right choice to tackle this one question, Wolf's metaphysics in the first critique, but still Kant seems to already have um, the, a certain philosophical agenda and certain perspectives are there in the first critique. Um, so what I'm trying to suggest is just that Karin does perhaps not yet fully measure how important her Wolfian perspectives on Kant are, and I really do think they set up a program for the new kind of Kant fashion that I think has begun to emerge. Um, coming back to the deeper stakes, the bigger picture, the philosophical projects themselves, as Karin does. And uh, you may have noticed that my questions are all very difficult. They are mainly meant to express my philosophical wonder, admiration, perplexity. So take whatever you find interesting, Karin, and leave the rest. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, well, Karin. Yes, uh, so uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, this, I'm, I'm very much impressed. And also, I know uh, that I won't be able to address uh, all of your very interesting remarks. Uh, so I will indeed have to pick uh, a few. Uh, so uh, I will start by the first uh, point concerning this distinction between metaphysics and epistemology. And this is something that I probably did not really um, uh, discuss uh, or, or adequately discuss, but it seems to me that the very distinction between metaphysics and epistemology is um, not very uh, pertinent to Kant's projects. And I, I would probably even argue that it is a much later uh, opposition that, that was probably introduced by, uh, by Neo-Kantianism, although I'm not completely sure about this. Uh, but at, at least I think that um, that we should be careful with the use of the term epistemology, uh, because I think that um, that the, using the the more generic term epistemology uh, makes it very hard to distinguish between an investigation into um, into the way in which we produce empirical knowledge on the one hand, and on the other hand the specific project of investigating into the way in which the human mind produces a priori cognitions of objects. Now you could argue that this, these are just two you know, um, themes that epistemology uh, deals with, but I think that Kant would rather consider his own investigation uh, as, as a kind of meta-metaphysics. Yes, as you know, he uses this term um, a metaphysics of metaphysics. And so um, I, I try to stay away from the term epistemology in order to, um, um, uh, to, well, to emphasize the specific nature of Kant's investigation into the human mind. Yes, so in, in the sense that he investigates the human mind, but only for the purpose of identifying these um, elements that go into our a priori cognition 
of objects. Yes, the warranted and unwarranted uh, versions. Uh, so um, even so, of course, one would have to distinguish between uh, Kant's, what I call his first order contributions to metaphysics on the one hand, and his uh, second order critical investigation into the human mind that is intended to uh, determine under which conditions this metaphysics is possible. Yes, but again, I would hesitate to um, frame this investigation into the human mind as carried out by Kant as uh, a contribution to epistemology. Even though, of course, it has elements in common with later investigations into the human mind that are more straightforwardly um, contributions to uh, epistemology. Yeah, so uh, I hope that is um, satisfactory. Uh, I must admit that I, I simply was had, had not read these, uh, these essays by Wolf that you mentioned, uh, so I, I will uh, go on and do so, maybe with my uh, team. Um, but I can maybe um, um, clarify why I didn't uh, by um, noting that I did not see my book as a real project on Wolf and Kant, but I rather um, presented those elements of Wolf's philosophy that I thought I needed in order to um, um, present the critique of pure reason uh, as resulting from a critical engagement with Wolf and the Wolfian tradition. Yeah, so it's definitely not intended as a kind of exhaustive uh, narrative about um, Wolf and Kant or everything that, uh, that went on in between the two. Yes, so I take to heart your, uh, your uh, references to Mendelssohn at the end. Uh, there again, I have to admit uh, that I do not really know a Mendelssohn's work. So this is on record. Yes, I admit this. Uh, and this again uh, suggests that, um, uh, that this is uh, something that I uh, or someone else uh, should look into. Yes, in order to, um, uh, to see how, how Kant also draws on, uh, on other German sources, uh, maybe even closer to home uh, than Wolf's own work. Yeah. Um, yes, so, so I jump basically from your first to your final points. Uh, but maybe in view of the time, I should um, I should uh, keep it uh, short, and um, I hope that we can have further uh, conversations on these issues in another context. Thank you very much, Karin. I also hope so. <laughs> okay, thank you, Karin and Stephanie. Um, let me now introduce to you Professor Brian Chance. Brian Chance is professor at the University of Oklahoma. And um, in view of the time, I will cite of the many Kant-related publications he has brought out. I, I only will quote three of the most recent. Um, that's the first one is Kantian non-evidentialism and its German antecedents, Crucius, Meyer, and Basedow, which was published 2019 in Kantian Review. The second one is Pure yeah. Understanding. Did you say something, Brian? I see that the image uh, has frozen, but... Well, I, I will just go on and if, if it doesn't work, we will go to... Oh, okay, you're back. Um, so the second okay. one... I... <laughs> Pure understanding. Okay. I'll, I'll do my best, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so everything cut off after Basadol, so well... Uh... Uh, I hope everybody can hear me, uh, and I hope that there aren't any other, um, uh, you know, technical snafus. So first, I want to I want to congratulate Karn for writing uh, such a stimulating and thought-provoking book. Um, in addition to incorporating a tremendous amount of secondary literature and a wide variety of language, none of which, as far as I could tell, was Dutch, which tells me there should be more Dutch Kant scholarship. 
Uh, Karin brings a tremendous diversity of primary literature to bear on her revisionist interpretation of Kant's critique of pure reason as a book that seeks to uh, not to destroy the metaphysics of the Wolfian tradition, but to pave the way to its reform. Uh, and so I want to just kind of speak off the cuff for a second. In terms of my structure, my, my comments are going to start with some fairly precise things and then move out to some more general ones. Um, but I got some more kind of introductory things to, to get to. And I, I also meant to set myself a timer, uh, which I forgot to do. So I will do that right now. Um, so I think it's a testament to the creativity of a work of Kant scholarship that it can force uh, even longtime readers of the critique uh, to read many of its central passages in a new light. Uh, and a testament to the argumentative rigor of such a work when that new light appears better than the old. And so by that measure, uh, at least in terms of my own understanding of Kant, Kant's reform of metaphysics has to be reckoned a great success. Uh, I will, of course, draw attention to places where I question either Karin's general reading or the path by which she comes to it. Uh, but on the whole, I, I thought this was a, a lively, carefully argued and, and meticulously detailed book. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my co-panelists uh, and uh, Henny for organizing this across three continents and two time zones and uh, everything else. Uh, so as I've already mentioned, this is my first of hopefully three points we'll see. Uh, the principal thesis of Karin's book is that the critique of pure reason is not an attempt to destroy the metaphysics of the Wolfian tradition, uh, but to pave the way to its, uh, to its reform. Uh, so Karin takes seriously uh, Kant's frequent claims that the critique is a propodeutic to metaphysics, but also uh, his claim that the metaphysics developed in the wake of the critique will, quote, uh, follow the strict method of the famous Wolf, uh, the greatest of all dogmatic philosophers. So this is from the B preface. Uh, and so I have to admit, I've always, I've read this phrase a lot, but I've always read it as a bit of hollow praise designed to satisfy uh, Kant's Wolfian readers. Uh, but having read Karin's book, having read his uh, Kant's letter to Kessner from 1990, of 1790, uh, I'm more inclined to take these remarks seriously. Uh, and, and indeed, these comments combined with the remaining comments that Karin considers in chapter eight, uh, make clear that Kant was not only interested in developing this reformed metaphysics in, the seven, in 1781, uh, but that he continued uh, uh, to be interested in doing so up through the end of the 1790s. Um, but as, a, as an initial point of criticism, it seems to me that Kant's uh, open letter to Fichte in 1799 presents more of a challenge to Karin's characterization of Kant's continued interest in articulating his reformed metaphysics than she suggests. So in the Zweig uh, translation of the relevant portion of the letter, Kant writes, uh, I must here remark that the assumption that I intended to publish only a propodeutic to transcendental philosophy and not the actual system of this philosophy is incomprehensible to me. Such an intention uh, could never have occurred to me since I took the completeness of pure philosophy within the critique of pure reason to be the best indication of the truth of that work. And so in 1799, uh, it appears that Kant regards the critique of pure reason as, as the system of transcendental philosophy and presumably uh, that this system is complete contrary to the many letters in the 1780s and the 1790s that attest to the, the contrary. Uh, and so Karin notes that Zweig's translation omits uh, a couple important words. So there's this phrase, uh, that's omitted from the, the second sentence, which I'll uh, now quote in German. Es hat mir eine solche Absicht nie in Gedanken kommen können, da ich selbst das vollendete Ganze der Kritik der, also der reinen Philosophie und der Kritik der reinen Vernunft für das beste Merkmal der Wahrheit derselben gepriesen habe. And so taking these omitted words into consideration, Karin translates the sentences or translates the sentence as follows. Uh, such an intention could never, uh, could have never occurred to me since I myself and the Critique of Pure Reason have lauded uh, the completed whole of pure philosophy is the best indication of the truth of this philosophy. Uh, so translated in this way, the passage does not indicate uh, that the critique uh, is the completed whole of pure philosophy, uh, but merely the place in which Kant had, had lauded the completed whole of pure philosophy, 
uh, and then as Karn puts it, uh, the preposition in pertains not to what is actually contained in the critique of pure reason, uh, but to what is recommended in it. Uh, read in this way, there can be no doubt that uh, the passage concerns Kant's long-term intention uh, to publish a metaphysical system, uh, not the question as to what he took himself to have achieved. So this is the, the reading that she prefers. Uh, and so in this reading, uh, Kant's letter is indeed consistent uh, with Karn's view that Kant, quote, never changed his mind as regards his intention to elaborate a reformed version of Wolf and Baumgarten's metaphysical treatises. Uh, in, in the broader context of the letter, however, it seems to me that, uh, that what Kant took himself to achieve or to have achieved is, is precisely what is at issue. Uh, so the letter responds to the anonymous review of uh, Buda's uh, Entwurf der Transcendental Philosophie, uh, published in the Erlangen um, Literary Magazine. Uh, and in this review, the reviewer uh, expresses surprise at Buda's insistence uh, that he, quote, has no difficulty understanding that Kant, as the inventor of the idea of transcendental philosophy, also realized it in its complete totality. So this is a quote from uh, in, from the, the magazine, but it's a quote from Bula's uh, Infowaf. Uh, the source of the reviewer's surprise is that Kant himself, uh, he alleges, regards the critique as a, quote, propodoidic to transcendental philosophy, but not a system of philosophy itself. Um, and so Kant's references, or I'm sorry, Kant references this assertion in the first sentence of the passage from his letter to Fichte, uh, which uh, I'll quote again in, in my own translation, which differs just a, a little bit from, uh, from Karens and from Zweig's. Uh, the presumption to claim, uh, I think this is the unwarranted um, presumption in, um, in Karens' translation, uh, to claim I intended merely to deliver a propodoidic to transcendental philosophy and not a system of this philosophy itself is incomprehensible to me. Uh, the presumption, the anmaßung, in question, you know, is the reviewer's claim that the critique is the propodoidic, the transcendental philosophy, but not a system of the philosophy itself. Uh, and Kant, in the, the, the open letter to Fichte, you, he puts a little bit of this in indirect data, so it seems clear to me that he's, he's almost quoting, you know, this, this part of the, of the review. Um, so the question at issue in this point of Kant's letter is not, I think, uh, what's recommended in the critique, um, but what the critique actually accomplishes. Um, and so that's a kind of contextual reason to kind of push back against the, um, the reading that Karn gives. Um, but there's also, I think, a, a grammatical ambiguity in the, the second sentence. And I want to I wanna pause for a second. I realize this is a little bit technical to do online. So if I've done this correctly, um, and I clearly have, and I thought I was going to be able to uh, include uh, the German passages here in the in the in the chat, but it seems like it seems like. Uh, sorry, I, I think Steve, you would you should be able to give him uh, the right to uh, to to uh, share the screen, right? Um, but Brian, you'd like to share it in the chat rather than sharing your screen, is that right? Um, what you know, what I've done, I've just copied. I mean, I can I can share my screen, but I've just copied the the passages, uh, and if I can if I can paste them into the the group chat, which is what I'm trying to do. That probably would make the would probably make the the most sense. Okay, so so I, sorry, I think I I can uh, I, I think you should now be able to share your screen. Yes, I thought that uh, that Steve should do this, but uh, Brian, can you share your screen? Uh, Brian would like to um, paste it into the chat, so I'm just uh, okay. looking at how to allow the chat, and I don't know if Henny and Pavel can also have a look at. Um, how that's allowed. Let's see here. Oh, I th it should be possible. I think so. Yeah, because I, I, you know, it's the, the you know, the, okay. this is the, yeah, the right. narrow point. You should, uh, to, you should be able to write in the chat. Okay. Yeah, it looks like I can, I can write in it, but I can't paste in it. Um, so let me, let me just share my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, or let me let me just continue with my remarks and then um, and, and then I'll I'll see if I can uh, can share the screen in in, in just a bit. Um, so so the um, 
uh, so the grammatical ambiguity in, in, in the, the second sentence uh, <clears throat> uh, that I, uh, is one that I think makes more sense to resolve in, the, in, the, in favor of the reading that, that Karn wants to resist. So the, the second sentence is the one I quoted before. I'll be a little bit slower this time. Uh, es hat mir eine solche Ansicht nie in Gedanken kommen können, da ich selbst das vollendete Ganze der reinen Philosophie in der Kritik der reinen Vernunft für das beste Merkmal der Wahrheit derselben gepriesen habe. Uh, and so what seems ambiguous to me here uh, is the antecedent of derselben. Uh, so in Karin's reading, uh, this antecedent is the pure philosophy, the completed whole of which is then lauded by the critique, uh, and so that works very well with the, the reading that, that um, she, uh, she wants to, to advocate for. Um, but it seems to me that another uh, grammatically possible and more proximate antecedent of Dezelben uh, is the critique of pure reason, right? So that's, that's just the, 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 the most proximate uh, in a feminine noun you find there. Uh, on this reading, <coughs> uh, which Zweig also prefers, uh, the completed whole of pure philosophy and the critique of pure reason is what would be lauded uh, as, quote, the best indication of the truth of the critique of pure reason, or as Swag puts it, uh, the best indication of the truth of that work. So he translates De Zellman as that work as an implicit reference to the critique. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the way I might translate this uh, passages, uh, such an intention could have never occurred to me since I myself have lauded uh, the completed whole of pure philosophy and the critique of pure reason as the best uh, indication uh, of the truth of the critique of pure reason. So if we interpret it in this way, um, there's, uh, we, we don't kind of get the, 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 the result that um, Karin wants. So I think, uh, and I'm going to just kind of um, move away from my prepared remarks because I, I see I'm, I've taken up far too much time. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that, that there's a way of, of making this, you know, consistent with the, the overall um, point that, that Karn wants to make. Um, and so, I mean, what I would, I mean, so it seems to me that you could undercut the, the relevance of this um, by just pointing a little bit more to the context. So this particular author uh, is clearly a very big fan of Fichte and wants to, you know, talks about how Kant started transcendental philosophy, but, uh, um, um, but Fichte completed it. And so it's this very kind of pro-Fichtean writer. Uh, and so the idea that Kant would want to, you know, rather be known or rather have the critique be known as the prophet, or rather have his propodeutic be taken for the system itself than to have Fichte's system be taken for the system seems a very reasonable thing to me. Um, so I, I want to, um, I'm going to skip the, the second uh, set of remarks that I had, although I'm going to just very briefly um, maybe ask some of them in the form of a question. Um, <clears throat> and so I, in, in, and this pertains primarily to the, to the last chapter, and so I, I'm curious, I, I'd like to ask Karin to tell me or tell us a little bit more about um, the the role of um, sensibility uh, in the projected system of, of metaphysics. Uh, so, you know, we've got uh, this, you know, transcendental philosophy, which is this thing that has begun in the critique, but not finished in the critique. Uh, we have, you know, transcendental critique, which kind of paves the way to the, you know, the new uh, reformed metaphysics. Um, and so, you know, Karn wants to say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to come back here, that, uh, that when it comes to the, the, the content of transcendental philosophy, uh, we have the metaphysical deduction and the analytic principles that belong to it, uh, the transcendental deduction, the schematism, the phenomena noumena chapter mostly uh, relate to transcendental critique. Um, and so since the, the analytic of principles uses the schematized categories to demonstrate the principles of possible experience, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it would seem that uh, part of the content of transcendental philosophy uh, would involve a little, you know, some aspect of pure sensibility. Uh, but there are some passages um, in the book that suggest uh, the, the contrary. So in, in chapter two, 
Um, when Karn is talking about the inaugural dissertation, she writes that it and the critique, quote, uh, defend the position that metaphysics ought to purge itself of any concepts and judgments gained by sensibility in order to resolve its internal conflicts. Uh, in chapter three, when she uh, talks about Kant's two-pronged critique of metaphysics, uh, she writes that the critique requires uh, scientific metaphysics to, quote, shed its dependence on pure sensibility. Uh, and there are a number of places uh, where, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, where Kant emphasizes that transcendental philosophy concerns the, the pure intellect and the pure intellect entirely. Uh, and one of the um, primary senses in which the intellect is pure, um, that's my timer, is that it's non-sensible uh, and that its products are, are independent of sensibility. So, so this is just a kind of uh, clarificatory question about the role of uh, pure space and time in the, the projected system of metaphysics. And then my, my last comment, and I'm going to have to be super brief about this, I apologize, uh, but so, you know, in the beginning of the, the book, the very first sentence in the preface uh, is this quote by Mendelssohn about the, the alles zermalmende Kant. Um, and, and, and one of the, you know, the, the, the kind of the chief argumentative uh, claims of the book is that <clears throat> Mendelssohn is wrong about that. We have this, um, uh, you know, reform of metaphysics. And so I guess my last question is, can we, can we, can we separate the reform um, from the, you know, from, uh, uh, or, uh, from, from the, the claim about Mendelssohn's, because it seems to me, I mean, one, one way of thinking about this is that, I mean, when I think of, um, of a semanta, you know, metaphysics, right, <clears throat> uh, and it's something that's, that has roughly the same form, um, but, you know, is, is far less ambitious, right, than, uh, than what Wolf and, and others, others saw. Um, I mean, to me, that seems like, I mean, I, I, it, to me, that seems, um, um, a, a plausible kind of reading of a lot of this material that we can take this uh, reformed metaphysics that uh, Karin that you sketch in, in, in book eight and say, yeah, this is what Kant intended to do. Uh, and still saying that Mendelssohn was right, that this kind of version of metaphysics is, you know, ground up, you know, chewed up uh, in comparison to um, uh, what uh, the discipline was uh, under Wolf. So, I'm going to stop there, but I, I hope everyone was able to hear most of that. Thank you, Brian. Um, we go immediately to Karen's reply. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, so um, uh, let me let me see. So about this open letter to Fichte and the translation problem. Yes. Yeah, so I see your point. Um, uh, you refer to the context. I'll have another. Uh, I'll have to take another look and and um, and. You know, f f see whether whether I agree with your uh, with the role you give to this immediate context. I know that at this point, various um, students of Kant and friends had pushed him to making a strong claim uh, about uh, what what he wanted, uh, what he had achieved in the in the critique of pure reason. So Bühler was definitely not the only point of reference uh, at this point. Uh, so about the uh, the way of interpreting the sentence, I see that there are various possibilities. I also see that the um, uh, the, the the order in which he places the various uh, clauses is not the most natural one. Yes, mm -hmm. so that's why uh, the misunderstanding, as I see it, uh, could emerge. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I I would like to hold on to uh, my claim that the in, yes, so that the, that the in refers to the critique of pure reason in the sense that he claims himself to have uh, lauded something in the critique of pure reason. And I think that if this is not added, or if, if the in is not taken uh, to refer to this context, then there's also something a bit funny about the sentence, I think, yes, because then we do not know where Kant's uh, lauded um, that which he had achieved in uh, in the critique of pure reason, mm -hmm. but I think that this this meeting is maybe not the most ideal uh, um, context to go into these uh, details. Although I would love to do so uh, on another occasion, mm -hmm. um, I think your um, 
your second point about the role of sensibility is a, is a very good one. And it's also something that I have really, really struggled with. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I can maybe um, um, somehow uh, mitigate this by uh, suggesting that Kant himself probably also struggled with this. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because he, he very much wanted to turn metaphysics into a purely intellectual discipline. Yes, this, I think, is what he wants to do in the uh, inaugural dissertation. But as I argue in the book, this is also something that he wants to do uh, in the critique of pure reason and, and, and something that he holds, holds on to. Uh, on the other hand, he, uh, as we all know, he strictly distinguishes two sources of cognition, sensibility and thought. And he wants, following Baumgarten, to in a way emancipate uh, the realm of sensibility and to um, um, uh, claim that it contains a priori uh, structures, yes, namely space and time. Then the question emerges, of course, well, um, at what level am I going to deal with these a priori elements that are proper to sensibility? And the only uh, place where they can be treated is within the ontology. In his, so that is to say the first part of his future system. Now Baumgarten and Wolf also deal with spatial and temporal determinations in their ontology, but do not rigorously distinguish them from intellectual determinations. Yes. So I think that Kant could only um, um, treat space and time and maybe various determinations of them uh, in the first part of his projected ontology. Now, the question is, of course, well, does this um, uh, undermine his ideal of a metaphysics that, that, is, that itself is purely intellectual? So this is the question that I've struggled with, yes? And I, I, I hope it's possible to claim that this um, inclusion of space and time does not undermine the idea of purely intellectual metaphysics. Why not? Because metaphysics as a purely intellectual discipline can treat um, the space and time as subject matters or as, as, as part of its subject matter without therefore itself um, carrying out intuitions. Yes, yeah, so it can think about space and time, treat them as forms of intuition, without thereby itself um, somehow having to rely on sensibility. Yeah. So that would, I think, be a way out. Whether this way out is really convincing, I do not really know. And I admit that in the book, I probably, especially in chapter eight, I probably hesitate a little bit as to whether uh, metaphysics can be purely intellectual in all regards. Yes, I think that now I would um, make the claim that I just made in um, in um, in the, in a stronger way than I actually did uh, in the book. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then then uh, so your idea that that maybe Mendelssohn uh, was right to. Uh, to focus on the uh, corrupt state of metaphysics uh, and how this is related to Kant's notion of reform. Well, I think that Kant is also very critical of the uh, actual state metaphysics is in, in his own days, mm. as, as, as is clear from the introductory uh, parts of the Critique of Pure Reason, and um, um, deplores especially all these, you know, contra controversies that, uh, that are completely useless. So maybe I did not focus a lot on what Kant thought was really um, uh, wrong uh, in, in the metaphysics uh, of his days. Yes, I do deal with the debates uh, among early post-Kantian, uh, sorry, post-Wolfian philosophers, uh, but only uh, uh, very uh, briefly. And, um, and this, I think, is part of my, my um, well, idea to focus on the, uh, on, on the reform aspect of Kant's 
uh, project. Yes, the, his, his effort to reform metaphysics. But it seems to me that the two are not really different. Yes, so you can be very negative about certain aspects of a discipline, uh, but at the same time, uh, try to um, develop a version that um, will prevent metaphysicians in the future from making uh, similar mistakes. Mm. Yeah, so... Uh, so I, in a way, I don't really see why you would, um, you know, uh, take apart mm -hmm. uh, Mendelssohn's view on the one hand and Kant's idea that the discipline uh, requires reform uh, on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Karin, for your reply. Uh, I propose that we have a short break now, let's say five minutes. But before you go away, five minutes, um, I just posted a link in the chat and if you click on that link you will find a flyer uh, with which if this debate has intrigued you and fascinated you you can buy the book which we are discussed with an with a discount of 20 percent um, so I propose that um, those who want can now take a drink or uh, go to the bathroom and we see uh, I, I will be back again here in five minutes I would now like to introduce to you uh, Professor Paul Franks um, whom I will ask to unmute already um, Professor Paul Franks um, works at Yale University and he not only works on Immanuel Kant but also on German idealism and also a lot on Jewish philosophy, but also on the foundations of human sciences and on post-Kantian approaches within analytic and continental philosophy. He is the author of um, the book All or Nothing, Skepticism, Transcendental Arguments and Systematicity in German Idealism, which was published in 2005 with Harvard University Press. And he also co-edited the theological and philosophical writings of Franz Rosenzweig. Um, this edition was published by Hackett Publishing Company in 2000. Um, I won't go to any of the more recent articles on, on Jewish philosophy, um, and I will give the floor immediately to Paul Franks. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and for including me in this uh, discussion of a very important book. I want first to say something about uh, Karen de Boer's achievement and how much I appreciate it. It's a, a necessary and also I think very productive uh, redressing of the balance in the reading of the Critique of Pure Reason and it's also meticulously carried out. Uh, incidentally, uh, I, I would maybe point out also um, since Mendelssohn's uh, characterization of Kant as all destroying um, one and so on has come up a few times it's worth noting that that I don't think means that uh, he took Kant to be destructive uh, alone <laughs> or, and nor does it mean that um, he took him to be destructive of metaphysics as such uh, in, in the context it's really about um, Kant's criticism of uh, the way in which metaphysics is done in a contemporary setting and later in the introduction to the Morgenstern he also expresses the hope that Kant will rebuild in the same spirit what he has torn down. Um, Mendelssohn was also very critical of the way uh, general metaphysics uh, was done and the extent to which it was even possible. Uh, his own emphasis was on special metaphysics and, and proofs of immortality and existence of God and I think that's what his concern is about. Um, in any event, um, uh, as has been mentioned, both neo-Kantian and analytic readings of the critique have tended to emphasize the discontinuities between Kant and his predecessors, uh, not least uh, the Leibniz book in metaphysics, and um, either that was to focus on the necessary conditions for the possibility of science or on the necessary conditions for the possibility of ordinary experience. And interesting as both those projects are, I think uh, Karen DeBoer's book shows very convincingly 
that Kant never lost sight of his ultimate goal, which was the reform, not the rejection or the overthrow of Wolfian metaphysics. Uh, so I'm very convinced by this. And I think uh, the argument sheds a great deal of light on many passages in the critique, and, and I'm not going to go through all of them, um, but th there are many cases in which uh, it, it's shown compellingly in the book, I think, that a certain very sp sort of strange formulation is responding to something quite specific in, in Wolf, and that's, that's a great contribution. So thank you. Um, with that said, I think it's also uh, worthwhile for me perhaps to try now to push the balance back a little bit in the other direction as well. Um, and hopefully um, as, as a result of this um, re-emphasis of the continuity with, metaphys with the metaphysics of both, it will be um, uh, um, the, the way of bringing out the discontinuities between Kant and his predecessors can be done in a, in a slightly more sophisticated way. Um, I think that's the way this sort of reading should go. Um, so let me um, start with this idea of the reform of metaphysics. Um, it's certainly true that Kant speaks of the reform of metaphysics, and he never says that he's carrying out a revolution or a Copernican revolution or anything like that, um, although this is often attributed to him. Yet the idea of a turn, uh, of some sort of science founding breakthrough, which seems like more than a reform, does seem to be at least implicit in Kant's discussion in the, uh, in the preface to the critique of uh, the analogy between his project and that of the scientific breakthroughs of Copernicus, Kepler, and Newton. So something that seems more radical than reform seems, as I say, at least implied. And it seems to me that every claim of Karin de Boas about the retention and reform of the Wolfian metaphysical project is compatible with the emergence within Kant's work of something new, something that necessitated a rethinking of the project um, whose status as reform or revolution one could then uh, discuss. And that something new is, in brief, an account of object cognition and the necessary conditions of its possibility. Um, I would also suggest that it can be organized under the rather Copernican rubric of the idea of a perspective or a standpoint. Um, one has uh, the idea of the unity of apperception as the form of the first person perspective, or if you like, the perspective of a finite rational cognitive agent, a discursive rational agent in general. Then one has the idea of the categories as the forms of the agency, the cognitive agency of such a, uh, of a person occupying such, um, such a perspective and of a world on which they take such a perspective. Um, one has the idea of concepts as standpoints, as Kant puts it at A658, B686. And then finally, one has the notion of the forms of sensible intuition as forms of the interface between such a discursive cognitive agent and uh, the world, um, forms whose specific features delineate what Kant calls in the aesthetic the human standpoint, A26, B42. Um, so th these are new ideas, and I would, if they have some um, precedent within both in metaphysics, I would be very interested to know, but it seems to me it's part of a real rethinking um, of what a concept is, of what thinking is, of what judging is in particular, um, as a result of looking at what is missing from Kant's point of view in both in metaphysics, namely an account of object cognition and the way of dis uh, and the distinction between uh, object cognition and uh, mere thinking. Um, and as this new idea or complex of ideas emerged, it's certainly true, and I'm convinced that Kant did not think that he had to give up the reforming project. Um, but at the same time, it must be the case that 
the character of the of the reformed project would have to be very different because the very notion of what a concept is would be different. I mean, I think it, if I understand from the book that the the project of Wolf's of general metaphysics is to um, is to give an, an exhaustive and systematic account of the necessary concepts involved in any thinking of objects. But first of all, from Kant's point of view, that already has to be separated out into several different uh, domains, shall we say, um, different sorts of, um, uh, of thinking, different sorts of cognition, different sorts of object, and therefore different sorts of representation as well. And all of those would have to be thought of not as sort of independently standing components that could be put together as ingredients into a judgment, but rather as um, understood within the context of the unity of judgment, which is itself to be understood within the context of the unity of apperception and the first person perspective. Um, so I think that is a continuation, but it's also a transformation. And it would have to require, as I think comes up in the book, a, a radical reorganization of the thing. And, and often not, it's not so clear how exactly everything would be uh, reorganized. Um, but it also, more than that, I think, more than just a reorganization, more than just a change of, of shape, it would also change the significance of such a project. Uh, for one thing, um, Kant, Kant's critical project itself changed. Uh, and I, that would have further implications, I think, for what the reform the general metaphysics would look like. There is um, the, uh, the, the second critique, the critique of practical reason, for which Kant did not see the necessity at the time when he wrote the first critique. Um, so the emergence of a, a new principle of practical cognition, cognition of the good, that required its own deduction. And then, of course, the third critique that also not only did he not see the necessity, he didn't even see the possibility of a critique of the power of judgment at the time. All of this gives rise to a very different view of the way in which one divides up the system of representations uh, and what they're necessary for, uh, which aspects of, of, of judgment and cognition and so on. Um, now, Karen de Boer notes that, this is the, right at the end of the book, although Kant did not give up the project, the this is a quotation, the original aim lost much of its appeal. <laughs> so that's, that's the part that I want to push on here, right? So, did it, so what appeal did it have left? Why, why did it lose its appeal? Um, and I think in part it's because I want to suggest that something else rather more radical emerged, which one would have to carry out um, as a way of rethinking um, this project. And in particular, one would have to look more closely at the different sorts of object cognition, the different sorts of necessary conditions, including uh, those explored in the critique of judgment and so on. Um, that would be a, a, a major project that leads to other metaphysical projects um, like the metaphysics of metaphysical foundation of natural science, which don't really fit within the general metaphysics um, because they, they have to look at the way in which um, these pure representations or pure concepts are related to um, empirical concepts and either to intuition or in the case of practical philosophy to, to action. Um, so it's not that it would be impossible to carry out some version of Wolfian metaphysics, but I wonder how worthwhile it, it would still be and whether these other projects emerging from the uh, reform attempt would not be more urgent. And I think that can explain to some extent what happened uh, after Kant's um, uh, successors um, started to do their own work. But perhaps even more than that, right? The, the, um, the, it, it's in the metaphysical deduction that uh, Karen de Boer says is, is not really within the scope of the book, that the principle, the, the categories, the principle of the system starts to emerge. And I think that it only starts to emerge there. Um, but becomes a lot clearer in other parts of the book, for example, in the parts of the critique of pure reason, that is. Um, for example, in the rethinking of what the judgment is uh, in, the, uh, in the middle of the uh, B deduction. And this ultimately led Kant's successors, yes, to redo something like Bolt's general metaphysics, but by means of a rethinking of logic itself. Because the very notion of a judgment and the very notion of a concept had changed, and therefore 
I think what had more appeal was the idea of some sort of rethinking of transcendental logic or speculative logic that would also be open to other possibilities within general logic, which Kant was not. Um, so we get Maimon's logic, um, Fichte's work on logic, Hegel's logic, and so on. Um, I think I'm going to just go uh, skip a part here for the sake of time. Um, I want to ask if, if there would be any room in Kant's version of the metaphysical system for not only the concepts concerning beings in general, but also judgments about beings in general. And it seems as though there would be some. Uh, there is a, a place in the book around page 123 to 4 where um, Karen notes that it makes sense to agree with Ray Langton that Kant does not reject physical monadology in, quote, in all respects, unquote and that he maintained, quote, a minimal and agnostic version. So there's not only the necessary concepts, but some argument about structure and form as well. Um, well, how exactly is that supposed to work? Presumably, such a metaphysics would be minimal in the sense that it's only what's required by um, the categories and the ideas and so on. Um, and it's agnostic with respect to whatever goes beyond that uh, minimal degree. Um, this would seem to mark a major distinction between general and special metaphysics, since in the, uh, in the latter, in special metaphysics, Kant says there is no doctrine, only a discipline. But why should that be? Um, if a minimal and agnostic version of general metaphysics may be developed uh, within the critical account by means of nothing more than the idea of, let's say, underlying centers of force that could never be given in sensible intuition, then why is it impossible to make minimal and agnostic judgments about supersensible beings that can never be given in sensible intuition? And there are at least some passages in the first critique where Kant does seem to say that. Or conversely, if those apparently more substantive claims about special metaphysics are to be said, to be interpreted as disciplinary, that is to say, as disguised negations, shall we say, um, rather than affirmative claims, then isn't the same true of the remarks about things in themselves where Kant seems to commit himself to a minimal and agnostic version of physical monadology? Isn't that, in fact, a disciplinary rejection um, of um, any identification of the physical objects determined within the relational web of space, time, and community with things in themselves? And this would then be one aspect of the critical project of preventing the encroachment of features of sensibility upon general metaphysics, which Kant notes at the end of the aesthetic would have disastrous consequences for theology. Everything would have to be spatio-temporal. So let me just close then with some questions that I have raised. Um, so why did the project of completing the system of metaphysics, quote, lose much of its appeal, unquote? What appeal did it retain? would it not have required very significant reorganization in light of new discoveries that came to light in the course of Kant's investigation of the conditions of the possibility of object cognition? What room would there be in the incomplete system of metaphysics uh, for doctrinal rather than merely disciplinary judgments? Uh, and is it not appropriate to say that although Kant intended to reform metaphysics, Nevertheless, and despite his intentions, which Karen de Boer has so compellingly interpreted, he initiated a revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So Karen, uh, another series of questions for you. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, yes, again, uh, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for all your um, comments and questions. And um, I think the first point concerning um, uh, the notion of a revolution um, is, is very pertinent and it will allow me to uh, specify maybe what I take to be new in Kant's project um, and, and that is to say the way in which he really, you know, uh, moves beyond his Wolfian predecessors. Um, I think that what is new in Kant's project is his um, um, decision to interrupts the work of the metaphysician 
and investigate the very possibility of metaphysics. So this is the metaphysics of metaphysics. And that had not been done uh, before, even though maybe you could argue that David Hume um, um, was, was aiming at something similar. Um, uh, so, so what is new is precisely, as you also point out, the very question, what does it take to turn something into an object of cognition? Yes. And, and after finishing the book, I've been thinking a bit more about this, um, about his interest in the process of objectification as something new, as something that is, is very different from the model of, um, of cognition um, that um, was, you know, circulated among his predecessors. And that has more, that is more dependent on, on the model of, of mathematical inferences. And that's all about thought moving from one determination to the next. Yes, yeah, so Kant takes up a different perspective and wants to know what does it take the human mind to turn representations into an object of cognition. And in that context, he indeed needs to um, uh, rethink and reconsider what we mean by a concept and what we mean by a judgment. And I think that he does so already in the uh, A version of the transcendental uh, deduction and also already in context of the metaphysical deduction. Yes, so I don't think we need to wait until the, uh, the second edition to, uh, to find uh, Kant's radical new ideas concerning concept and judgment, uh, among other things. So as I also tried to explain during my introduction, I think that uh, for Kant, a concept is a rule. Yes, a rule that tells us how to unify a manifold to conceive of a manifold as a unity. And by conceiving of a manifold as a unity, we at the same time posit the content of a representations over against ourselves. Yes, that is to say, we um, produce um, uh, these contents as a unity of which we are conscious. Yes, that is what I take to be the idea of a uni unity of apperception. So this is, I think, um, and I think we agree on this, this is novel in Kant's uh, critical project. Um, but um, in my view, this, this novelty came up um, uh, or emerged from Kant's concern to reform metaphysics. Yes, it's part of this interruption. You interrupt metaphysics, you take, you take a step back, you start thinking about what does it take to, to turn something to an, into an object at all. But this is all, at least according to the original plan, just a means to, you know, uh, prepare the actual uh, new metaphysics. And then I take it that as Kant um, went along, he became more and more fascinated by his own discoveries, uh, by, by the way he, he, he was, you know, reconceiving these elements of cognition in a way from, from, uh, from scratch. And I, of course, it's only, you know, a speculative, but I can imagine that he became more fascinated by his new approach to the workings of the human mind than by the original um, plan to, uh, to, to develop a metaphysics along the lines of his Wolfian predecessors. Yeah? Now, you also uh, refer to other projects that emerged um, after the publication of the Critique of Pure Reason, including the second and the third critique, of course, I agree that this was not um, uh, uh, scheduled. However, it is clear that Kant from the, at least from somewhere in the 70s or, or maybe even the late 60s, had the idea that, um, uh, had the idea of developing both a metaphysical of nature and a metaphysical of morals, yes? So the idea of a practical philosophy um, uh, goes back to the late 60s or early 70s uh, what is new in that regard is, is the idea of a separate critique. Yes, and so I don't want to, uh, to deal with this issue. I haven't uh, studied uh, this, uh, this aspect very much in, uh, in detail. Uh, so I agree that new projects um, emerged 
and became more relevant to Kant, probably also given uh, the, you know, the context. Yes, yeah? so what, uh, what were his readers interested in? And they were more interested in issues concerning morality and maybe also um, teleology and so on than in, in, in a boring, abstract uh, metaphysical system. Yes, so it, it hasn't been my intention to convince all readers, including you, that um, Kant's system of metaphysics would be, you know, extremely exciting. Not at all. But I think, as you also pointed out in your introductory remarks, that it's important to, um, to know or, or to at least to have a, a specific idea of what Kant wanted to do in order to um, clarify certain rather obscure parts uh, of the critique of pure reason that have been uh, the, 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 the content of, of much debate. Uh, yes, so something new. Yes, and so apperception also figures in that context. Yes, of, because for Kant, uh, apperception is an important element of his effort to understand what it means to objectify the content of our representations. Yes, there has to be, has to be um, the unity has to be apperceived. Uh, of course, apperception cannot do this work all by itself. It also requires the imagination, which I take maybe an even more important uh, element of Kant's account in the A deduction uh, than uh, what he has to say about apperception uh, per se. Uh, let me see if there is something I should add. Um, Yes, maybe uh, one day I should do uh, a paper on the metaphysical deduction. Uh, and um, whether the future system would have contained uh, concepts as well as judgments, I would say yes, as namely those judgments that have the function of principles. Yes, yeah, so the system of, of, of principles of the pure understanding that we find in the critique of pure reason would have been uh, transferred to the uh, or in, to the system and would have been presented again in that context. It seems to me. Um, with regard to the question, well, what so so what about this uh, this so-called minimal uh, monodology? I think that that the most natural place for that would have been Kant's projected uh, rational cosmology. Um, and and we can, as it were, you know, um, more or less figure out what he would have done within his rational cosmology by looking at uh, the positive elements um, elaborated in the context of his uh, of the antinomies um, in in the in the transcendental dialectic. Yeah, so that that would be the way to go, I think. And I think that as long as the thought of a simple that is somehow constitutive of matter is a thought, is presented as a thought, and not as um, a, a cognition of objects, uh, it, it, it could be included in, in this critical version of, um, of, of Wolfian general uh, cosmology. I'll, uh, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. Let's go directly to Eric Watkins. Eric Watkins, of course, is a well-known figure within uh, the Kant community, and um, he is professor uh, of philosophy at the University of California, San Diego. Among his publications, um, let me just quote uh, the well-known um, monograph, Kant and the Metaphysics of Causality, uh, Cambridge University Press 2005, and uh, also, uh, two collections uh, he edited. Uh, one is the Kant and the Sciences, uh, already from uh, 2000, and um, another one more recent is Kant's Theory of Biology, which he co-edited with Ina Goy um, and published with De Gruyter in 2014. And let's not forget to mention that he was one of the collaborators to the uh, Big Kant lexicon. So 
Um, I give the floor to you, Professor Watkins, uh, to give your comments and uh, to ask some questions uh, to Karin. Thank you so much, Henny, and I'd like to thank the organizers for putting on such a wonderful event, and of course to Karin for writing a wonderful book. Um, so in her impressive book, Kant's Reform of Metaphysics, Karen de Boer argues that Kant's primary goal in the critique of pure reason is not so much uh, to criticize the claims and arguments of traditional metaphysics, but rather to reform metaphysics so that it can be established as a science. To this end, it investigates the thought of some of Kant's immediate predecessors, especially Wolf and Crusius, traces the development of Kant's views throughout his pre-critical and critical periods, and offers interpretations of a number of major parts of the first critique, including the transcendental deduction, the schematism chapter, the appendix to the transcendental analytic, and the architect architectonic. I was especially appreciative of the contextual and developmental approach on display throughout her book, as it helped her to avoid the kind of anachronistic reading that one finds all too frequently, and to shed important light on Kant's actual intent in the first critique. Since time is short and Chiron has already provided a précis of the book, I will dispense with the detailed summary of its main claims and arguments and will instead just recall Karen's main thesis, namely that on her view, Kant's project is to reform traditional metaphysics, which entails both that some things must be preserved and that some things must be rejected. Specifically, Kant took over from Wolf, quote, the idea of metaphysics as a comprehensive system of the concepts and principles constitutive of any cognition of objects, as well as the idea that such a system ought to be established by means of a strict method end of quote, page 42. In this way, Kant hoped to be able, quote, to preserve what he took to be the rational core of the metaphysical disciplines devoted to the soul, the world as such, and God, page three, since those are crucial to supporting the moral improvement of human beings and to thwarting the dangers of skepticism, naturalism, and one might add, as Kant does, atheism. He rejected, however, quote, the assumption that the treatment of these ideas and the determination amounts to the cognition of objects, end quote. And one of his reasons for rejecting cognition of such objects is that it is based on, quote, the assumption that sensibility and thought are nothing but two different, uh, two different ways to obtain knowledge of things, end quote. An assumption that Karen labels continuism. So let me begin by asking Karen about something that receives really, relatively little explicit attention in the book but that could seem to be directly relevant to her overall project as just described, namely how she thinks that the transcendental dialectic is supposed to contribute to Kant's argument as a whole. As is well known in the transcendental dialectic, Kant offers an extensive analysis of pure reason so that he can determine whether pure reason can generate cognition of the objects of special metaphysics. This is at least how Kant sets up the transcendental, the transcendental dialectic, quote, does reason in itself, that is pure reason, contain a priori synthetic principles and rules, and in what might such principles consist? End quote. That's from A306, B363. And he then answers this question by analyzing and rejecting arguments that would establish cognition of the soul, the world as a totality, and God. What this way of setting up the transcendental dialectic suggests is that if the transcendental analytic had already established that we could not cognize things in themselves in general, which would thus include the soul, the world as a totality, and God, then Kant would be fully justified in immediately answering this question negatively and moving on. The first critique would have been half as long, though to my mind, twice as confusing. However, if Karen thinks as I do, that the transcendental dialectic does contribute to the overall, overall argument of the first critique, and that it does so by showing that pure reason cannot generation, generate cognition of the objects of special metaphysics, then one wonders what is supposed to show that we cannot have cognition of the objects of general metaphysics. I think Paul was picking up on this point as well. That is, if the transcendental dialectic shows both that Kant sees the need for an argument ruling out the possibility that we can cognize the soul, the world as a totality, and God, and that he provides such an argument by ruling out all the main types of arguments that attempt to establish such claims to cognition, then it would seem, by reason of parity, that Kant should also see the need for 
and provide an argument that rules out the possibility that we can cognize things in themselves in general. But where are we supposed to find such an argument? Note that it cannot be in the transcendental analytic, for example, in the transcendental reduction, because if it were offered there, then the transcendental dialectic would not be needed. Instead, what the transcendental analytic shows is that the categories which one might use to attempt to form cognition of the objects of general metaphysics, metaphysics are valid for objects of experience. But that leaves unaddressed the objects of general metaphysics, namely the class of obje objects in general. My own view is that there's a complex division of philosophical labor between the transcendental analytic and the transcendental dialectic that leads to the encompassing conclusion that Kant wants to be able to draw regarding both the general and special metaphysics. But that specifying the division of labor in a way that is consistent with Kant's actual arguments is not a simple or straightforward matter. So I'd be curious if Karen has any thoughts on this that she'd be willing to share. As we've seen, Karen, comes, uh, Karen claims that Kant is reforming Wolfian metaphysics rather than replacing it with something radically different. This made me curious about how this claim applies to three different domains, practical philosophy, the fundamental principles of Wolfian metaphysics, and analytic truths. First, Kant at least presents the fundamental principle that underlies his entire metaphysics of morals, not only as entirely new, but also as explicitly opposed to Wolf's practical philosophy. For Wolf's ethics is based on an indeterminate concept of perfection, along with a completely generic concept of volition that lacks an a priori principle. From Kant's perspective, Wolf's position is heteronymous, in stark contrast to his own commitment to a supreme principle of morality that is a priori and autonomous, since it is since based on a specific concept of positive freedom and rationality. Insofar as the metaphysics that Kant wants to rehabilitate is not first and foremost theoretical, it can't be given the restrictions he places on our theoretical cognition, but rather is fundamentally practical, the contrast he draws with Wolf's practical philosophy can seem to stand in some tension with the claim that Kant is simply reforming Wolf's position in this regard. At the very least, one could wonder whether replace is a more apt description than reform. Second, even with respect to theoretical philosophy, Kant is typically thought of as being highly critical of all or nearly all metaphysical claims, but especially of those of his rationalist predecessors like Wolf. For example, it is often claimed that Kant rejects the principle of sufficient reason as dogmatic, which is consequential insofar as it is for Leibniz and for Wolf one of the primary truths that is, put, that is put to use at many critical junctures in their philosophical systems. Specifically, the principle of sufficient reason is viewed either as unjustified, Kant does at least reject Wolf's derivation of it from the principle of contradiction, or as inapplicable to things in themselves, since applying it to things in themselves would violate Kant's doctrine of epistemic humility. Indeed, some even seem to think that Kant views with, with suspicion a close cousin of the BSR, namely Kant's own supreme principle of pure reason, which is, if the condition exists, then so too does the totality of its conditions, and thus the unconditioned. Their view is that this principle is precisely the source of the transcendental illusion that leads us to make dogmatic claims about the objects of uh, special and general metaphysics. Now, I myself do not accept these claims, as I think that Kant is much more sympathetic to the supreme principle of pure reason, even after one has distinguished its logical and real uses, since they apply differently to appearances and things in themselves. In this respect, I agree that Kant is more of a reformer than a critic of Wolf. So I wonder where Karen stands on this issue. Does she think that a rejection of continuism entails a rejection of the PSR? If so, how? Or is she open to accepting it as a principle that can be accepted as true if properly understood and restricted to a particular domain, just as Kant seems to for things in themselves when he says, and I quote, if the conditioned as well as its condition are things in themselves, then when the first is given, 
not only is the regress to the second given as a problem, but the latter is thereby really already given along with it. And because this holds for all members of the series, then the complete series of conditions and hence the unconditioned is thereby simultaneously given, or rather it is presupposed by the fact that the conditioned, which is possible only through that series, is given. End quote. That's from A498B 526. Third, the reason it is often given for rejecting claims like the PSR is they're analytic. In contrast with the synthetic a priori claims that Kant believes would have to constitute the core of metaphysics. Lanier Anderson has recently argued that Kant's quote, master argument against traditional metaphysics of the specific, specifically Wolfian variety turns on the alleged poverty of the notion of containment that he argues is fundamental to the analytic judgments that Wolf restricts himself to. Insofar as Kant breaks with Wolf by distinguishing between analytic and synthetic judgments, and then maintaining that the most crucial claims of metaphysics are synthetic rather than analytic, one might think, as Anderson does, that Kant has broken radically with Wolf. I myself am skeptical that this line of thought really represents Kant's master argument against the claims of traditional metaphysics. But I do see that it requires a response, especially given that I take Wolf's views seriously, unlike, say, Strawson, who simply dismisses metaphysical claims as meaningless. So again, I would be curious if Karen had some thoughts, even impromptu ones, about this multifaceted line of argument. I do note that these issues come up indirectly in chapter eight, where Karen claims, quote, that none of the metaphysical disciplines can consist of synthetic a priori judgments about things. This is from page 253. But if her view is that metaphysics, when properly reformed, consists of analytic principles, then I would like to know how analytic principles could serve as regulative principles. I would have thought that analytic principles like the laws of logic are constitutive of thought and that only synthetic principles could function as regulative principles. Now in chapter six, Karen claims that, quote, it is only in the schematism chapter that Kant fully develops the argument that supports his critique of post-Leibnizian metaphysics in the Transcendental Analytic, end quote, page 163. In the course of this chapter, Karen makes a number of interesting interpretive moves that deserve serious scholarly attention. For example, she holds that when the categories are used to think things as such, the categories are, quote, nothing but de-schematized pure concepts, end quote, from page 164. However, I'd like to focus on one of her other central claims in this chapter, namely that, quote, any a priori cognition of objects rests on non-intellectual conditions he calls schemata, which occur wherever the human mind unifies a given manifold, except in the purported a priori judgments about things as such, the soul, the world as such, and God, end quote, page 164. The question I'd like to ask, I'd like to raise is simply why a rationalist like Wolf should accept such a non-intellectual condition? Why is Kant not begging the question? Perhaps Karen is indirectly acknowledging this point when she says, quote, Kant rejects a core assumption of Wolfian metaphysics, namely the assumption that the intellect can obtain a priori cognition of all things, uh, of things all by itself, end quote, page 169. But one might wonder what, both why Kant is justified in rejecting that assumption, and if he does reject an assumption that is, as she notes, crucial to rationalist metaphysics, how can he still be reforming their metaphysics rather than rejecting it? In the course of this chapter, Karen notes, picking up on Kantian phrases, that without the schemata, our purely intellectual concepts would be empty and would not relate to an object. But what does it mean to call a concept empty? And what kind of relation to an object would be missing if a concept, say, refers to an object because the object has the property that the concept represents it as having? For example, if God happens to exist, then it can seem as if my claim, God exists, is true. Its truth is based on the concept referring to God. And in some non-trivial sense, the concept of God is not empty precisely because of the reference relation. Note that the judgment that God exists does not amount to cognition insofar as cognition 
is a special mental state that requires the satisfaction of further conditions. But why should Wolf think that only cognition counts? How can Kant rule out true judgments that are based on conceptual analysis without begging the question against the Wolfian? I would be curious if Karen had further thoughts about these issues. Though I've raised a number of questions about Karen's position, I'd like to close by reiterating how rich her discussion is. In fact, it's so rich that there is much more that I would like to ask about. For example, does the meta-metaphysical part of Kant's project have implications for the first order metaphysical project that, in Kant, that Kant engages in throughout the first critique? Or do all the implications go only in the other direction? And it is perhaps not shocking if I expressed interest in understanding exactly how Karen thinks that the argument of the transcendental deduction is supposed to go. But rather than pursue these questions further, I should simply conclude and let Karen reply to the questions I've already raised. Thank you, Eric, for your questions. Karin? Yes, uh, thanks, Eric. This is um, um, a lot. Thank you very much for a number of very um, uh, pertinent uh, questions and, and thoughts. And I, again, I, I know that I won't be able to do justice uh, to everything you have brought on the table. Uh, but I, um, I'm pleased um, with your um, um, reference to the transcendental dialectic because it's true that within the context of this book, I could not really um, uh, do a lot of work on the transcendental dialectic. Uh, I've I've done a bit more in a, in a recent uh, volume that was uh, that just came out on critique in German uh, philosophy. So I can maybe advertise this um, this book project edited by uh, Acosta Lopez and um, McQuillan. Um, so about the transcendental dialectic and how does it contribute to Kant's overall project and in particular um, the question is well why is the transcendental dialectic still necessary? In a way I um, I think I agree with you that the transcendental analytic um, already offers a kind of decisive uh, critique of the uh, claims in former uh, special metaphysics because the general, the, the transcendental analytic already uh, blocks the very possibility of making theoretical uh, judgments uh, about things that are not given, that are not spatial temporal. Um, and so you, you, you think that here um, emerges a problem because um, uh, if the transcendental dialectic is a necessary complement to the transcendental analytic, then the question emerges um, uh, whether the transcendental dialectic itself should not offer an argument against the, the possibility of um, uh, acquiring knowledge of things in themselves. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if I completely agree your worry uh, or whether I um, uh, represent it adequately, but it seems to me that uh, Kant uh, saw the analytic and the dialectic as two complementary parts that in a way have the same, the same results, yes, or that basically have the same results. Uh, that is to say, um, if, with regard to their, as it were, negative strands, both parts result in the, let's say, in the insight that the human mind cannot uh, 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 obtain theoretical cognitions of things in themselves. Neither of things as such, nor of particular things such as the soul, the world as such, and God. Yes? Now, the difference is that the transcendental analytic um, makes this argument with regard to the, to the object of general metaphysics, that is to say, things as such. Yes, so I take, at least I take on to argue in the transcendental analytic, in particular in the transcendental deduction, that we cannot obtain theoretical cognitions of things as such, but only of things insofar as they appear to us, that is to say, can potentially be turned into objects of experience. Yes, and that already blocks the path 
of um, uh, the path towards, you know, theoretical cognitions of God, world, and soul uh, pursued in in uh, in former special metaphysics. So in that regard, the transcendental analytic has already achieved a, a very important result, but the transcendental dialectic, in a way, uh, specifies um, the. Uh, the, this main idea by going through the various uh, doctrines uh, one by one and 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 to do and doing so systematically um, and and Kant of course he says well you know if people are not uh, convinced by uh, by my arguments in the transcendental analytic uh, they will certainly be convinced by my account of the antinomies where it, it, it appears very clearly that, uh, there is, that, that metaphysics entangles itself in problems insofar as it um, uh, somehow uh, brings in uh, s uh, sensibility uh, and, and, and hence creates uh, these antinomies. So I take the two uh, parts to be uh, complementary. Uh, and of course, also to differ uh, insofar as it as their positive elements are concerned, because the transcendental dialectic, in a way, uh, uh, provides us with the ideas of reason, and also provides us with the purely intellectual determinations that we are allowed to attribute to the ideas of pure reason, as long as we do so merely, as it were, in the element of thought. Yes. Uh, um, Yeah, so, so in a way, I don't really see a problem um, uh, in, in the fact that Kant goes on after the transcendental analytic and, and uh, uh, tackles the problems treated in former special metaphysics in a detailed manner. Yeah, so, so that is my answer uh, to your uh, question in that regard. Okay, I'm going to skip a few things and then um, um, turn to what you said about the principle of sufficient reason and more generally the problem that, uh, that some principles are, are considered to be either analytic or synthetic. Now, the principle of sufficient reason is a principle I haven't really uh, discussed in the book, so it's good that you draw attention to this. Uh, I think that Kant's... Um, um, more or less implicitly does deal with the principle of sufficient reason and in a way um, I, I take him to argue that in order to judge about the validity of the principle of sufficient reason we first of all need to um, specify its various roles that it can take yes it can it can be interpreted simply as the principle of causality it can be uh, interpreted as a principle that tells us to look for uh, the unconditioned. And that's the version that you focused on in your uh, comments. But I think there is another one, another version that he specifies, namely um, what he calls the, let me see, the, the highest principle of all synthetic judgments in the, um, uh, in the transcendental analytic, where he, um, uh, prior to his discussion of the, um, principles of the pure understanding. So he doesn't call it by that name, but I think that that, uh, that I think that according to Kant, we need a different principle. We need to replace the principle of sufficient reason with a different principle that somehow uh, guides us in our efforts to um, uh, generate synthetic a posteriori knowledge and this principle itself must be an a priori principle and i so the this this highest principle of all synthetic judgments tells us that any judgments uh, i'm going to make should somehow uh, be geared toward possible objects of experience yes and take into account uh, intuition and so on uh, so I, I just um, bring this in in order to illustrate that there is not a single principle of sufficient, of sufficient reason in the critique of pure reason, but that there are there are various versions, and that with regard of each of them, um, 
uh, the or that that count as it were um, offers reformed versions that follow from his more general uh, critique of metaphysics. Yes, so I agree that the principle of sufficient reason in the context of the transcendental dialectic can uh, be retained insofar as it uh, provides guidance and so on. Uh, it, it only becomes problematic insofar as we employ it to produce an object of cognition. That would be my point. Henny is uh, nodding, so that's good to know. Um, yes, then there is another discussion about the principle of sufficient reason, namely whether the principle itself is analytic or synthetic. I did not really discuss this issue and uh, maybe for two reasons. First of all, I find it a complicated issue. But secondly, I'm not sure if this question is still relevant to Kant's concerns. Yes, of course, the very possibility of synthetic a priori cognition is extremely relevant to Kant. Um, but once we take these principles to the, the principles such as the principle of, 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 uh, of sufficient reason and non-contradiction, to be somehow guiding or regulative principles, I do not know if we still want to know whether these principles themselves or the judgment that express these principles are either analytic or synthetic. Yes, so I, I might have more to say about this, but I think in view of the time, I should simply uh, stop here. Yes, so uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Karin. Um, I propose that um, after we have thanked the speakers and Karin, um, that we continue um, uh, so that we leave the Zoom session running and that there will be room then for a more informal Q&A session. So people who, who still have questions um, to, to Karin can ask them after we close, so to say, the official part of this meeting. Um, so please join me in thanking, however you can join me, um, in thanking uh, Karin for writing this book and also our four commentators of uh, today uh, for having spent so much time and energy uh, studying it and giving those uh, insightful comments and uh, some critical questions. So that were Stephanie Buchenau, uh, Brian Chance, Paul Franks and Eric Watkins. Thanks a lot and please feel free to continue in this informal modus. So you can also unmute your microphone if you want to say something, um, if you want to ask a question uh, to Karin. And please, uh, you, can, um, you can go to the program of the seminar, the Leuven Seminar for Classical German Philosophy, and you will see that we have some other events planned uh, for this term. And we also plan to continue with this online seminar um, in the second term of, uh, of the academic year. Well, I, the floor is yours, audience. <laughs>